Good evening, good morning, wherever you are in this world. Welcome to the first Church Bible Study Sunday for November. Today is November the 5th, 2023, as we near another end of the year, amazingly. Apologies for last week. We did not have a live stream. We had some technical issues and pray that this one goes well. So this is the name of our ministry, Restoration Fellowship, founded by Sir Anthony Buzzard. And this is the homepage, focusonthekingdom.org. You will find many other links to other websites we have. A free magazine we offer every month, Focus on the Kingdom. Just click on magazine. We have podcasts where Anthony reads his articles and books. And uh, we have many articles on this website as well that you can look at and books you can purchase and some of which you can read for free on this website as well. All apologies, our apologies, I should say, for the live stream page. We're still having some technical issues with that. I think you cannot see the uh, live stream there. So please go to the YouTube page of... Um, Focus on the kingdom, or and um, you should be able to watch it there. So I put it in the chat. So there's the uh, direct link there. So apologies for that. We'll try and get that fixed as soon as we can. So this morning we are finishing the second letter of Timothy by Paul, the apostle. Anthony will guide us through the reading there. But before we do, we have a youth lesson uh, from uh, some years back from uh, Sarah. And I thought we might play this again as a good reminder. I want to talk today about being Bereans. Well, what is a Berean and why would I want to be one? Bereans were people who lived in the town named Berea. And you probably don't live in a town named Berea, although you might. There is a Berea, Kentucky, I know. And there, there may be some other towns in, in other states called Berea. But anyway, why would we want to be like these people who lived in Berea? And they are found in Acts chapter 17. To see how good the Bereans were, we have to kind of see how bad the people in Thessalonica were. Um, so first of all, in verse 2, uh, yes, as we said, he so Paul went to the synagogue of the Jews, it says. This is the Jewish building where they meet on Saturdays, three Sabbaths, so three Saturdays in a week. He was reasoning with them from the scriptures, and that means, of course, the scriptures he had was only what we call the Old Testament, because the New Testament hadn't been written yet. This Acts is telling us about what Paul did in this part of the New Testament, so it hadn't been written while he was doing it. Okay, so he, in verse 3, he was explaining and giving evidence that the Messiah had to suffer and rise again from the dead. That sounds familiar. This is one of the two parts of the gospel. Remember from last week, we had two parts of the gospel. The first is the part about the kingdom to come on earth. The second part is that Jesus had to die and rise again from the dead. And then Paul said at the end of verse 3, this Jesus, whom I... Uh, proclaiming to you is the Messiah. So he is the one chosen, the one anointed to be king of that kingdom. So Paul was preaching both parts of the gospel here. He's talking about Jesus suffering and rising from the dead and talking about Jesus is the, the Christ, which is the same as Jesus is the Messiah. In other words, he is the king of that kingdom in the future. And some of them in verse 4 were persuaded. Okay, so they weren't all bad. <laughs> Definitely not. They joined Paul and Silas, and there were a large number, actually, of, of Greek people and a number of leading women. So there were some important women in this town of Thessalonica, and they were persuaded by what Paul, the evidence Paul gave from the scriptures, from the Old Testament. Okay, but then the Jews, but the Jews. Can you imagine how awful this is. So they, they get this mob together and they start wanting to bring this poor guy Jason out who was a believer, but he hadn't done anything wrong. And in fact, Paul hadn't done anything wrong either or Silas. 
and start dragging Jason and some of the other believers out saying and shouting about them and saying in verse 7, well, they're saying that there is another king, Jesus. Well, actually, that's true. They were saying that. There will be another king, Jesus. That's what Paul had been saying, that he is the Messiah, that is the king, the chosen king. And so this mob drags these poor people out, and eventually they had to get money, so they basically had to get take a bond, like to get out of jail, even though they hadn't do it, done anything wrong, they had to give money to be released. Anyway, so the people got Paul and Silas out of there pretty fast and took them to the next town, which was Berea, because obviously it wasn't safe in this town. Okay, then verse 11 is the key verse. So it says, these people in Berea, in this other town, were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. So this is why we want to be like these Berean people, because they did believe Paul's message about the kingdom and about Jesus dying and being raised, but they didn't just believe it because he said so. They were checking their scriptures, which is the Old Testament, every day, it says daily, to see whether he was actually speaking the truth or not. And when they saw that he was speaking the truth, in verse 12, they believed it. But they didn't just believe it because somebody was telling them. And along with a number of leading people in this town in Berea, and women and men, so a lot of them believed. So that is why we want to be like the Bereans, even though we don't live in Berea necessarily. And in the old days, I don't know if they do anymore, we used to call our youth groups in church Bereans. So that's, that's why. And some churches, I think, still do that. Or maybe there are some churches out there called Berean churches. Because we want to be more open-minded in the best way and believe what people say, but only if it fits with what it says in the scriptures. So I'm telling you, don't believe what I say or what anyone tells you about the Bible or teaches about the Bible. Do believe it, but only after checking it for yourself. And guess what? You have the Old Testament and the New Testament to check. So you can be like these people who were checking it daily, every day. And then they believed it because they saw it really is true. But check it out. Not just me, everyone else who teaches you about the Bible. So be like the Bereans. All right, so that was my wife, Sarah, with a reminder there to be a Berean. And a reminder for myself that I messed up this morning. I was supposed to open with uh, the prayer, the Shema. So actually, I'd like to do that this morning. I know Anthony usually does the prayer, but I'd like to open up with prayer. You know, when we pray, obviously, to God and, and Jesus, um, we ask for many things, and uh, we're always asking, asking of God and Jesus things. But this morning, I'd like to thank God and thank his son Jesus at his right hand for, for many things. So let's pray. Um, Father, I thank you for um, our lives. I thank you for our health. And... Um, I thank you myself for many things for the audience that's watching live right now. We thank you for them, for their support, continued support uh, with this um, somewhat different style of uh, church fellowship, Bible study. But we do thank uh, the, the many people who are uh, watching right now and especially the regulars, those people who have been with us for many years following Anthony and his ministry. I'd like to thank you, God, for Anthony and Barbara, my wife, our families here. We thank you for this uh, year as it continues to go by so quickly. <clears throat> we thank you for safety here in, in, the, in this country we're blessed to live in. We thank you for, uh, like I said, our health, especially as uh, we all get old, as, as we have to. And uh, I'd like to personally thank you for my mother, whose birthday it is. And uh, 
I guess I don't, well, I just don't think enough. <clears throat> like to thank you for my father as well. Also, thank you for my wife who had a, a birthday as well in the last few days. And uh, yes, and I, we, we just thank you, Lord God. And Jesus, we thank you for your sacrifice, your great faith in showing us the way for one day to, for you to restore peace, <clears throat> prosperity, and progeny to this uh, fallen world and awful state of situation that we're in. But we thank you. We thank you in all our griefs, in all our troubles, trials, and tribulations. And we thank you, lastly, for our little home church here. We thank you for Michelle, for Kay, for Vicky. We thank you for our ministry partners, Tracy and, and Robin, Pastor Robin Todd. Uh, we ask you, Father, to keep blessing them. And, and in our, again, in, in all our troubles, we thank you for what we do as little as it might seem to be but you know what we can do and offer to you father but we thank you god we thank you jesus and uh, together we say amen so we have the shema here let me say just something quickly about the shema the shema is uh, a hebrew word meaning obey or listen that you find in deuteronomy 6 4 and Mark chapter 12, verse 29, listen Israel or obey Israel, the Lord our God is one person. Now we say one person because obviously the Lord God is one non-human person, that is, an individual, a single self. Jesus calls him the Father, as do most of the New Testament writers. He is the Father, he is one. Uh, we are to worship him, the Father, as the only true God alone. So this is the first and greatest of all the commandments, Jesus says, when he was asked by a fellow rabbi. And uh, we'd like to just remind ourselves and remind everyone who fellowships with us to keep this in mind. Keep it in your heart in the morning, in the evening, before you go to bed, in your trials and tribulations. And uh, when the time comes for all of us to fall asleep in death, uh, that we may have a chance to recite this uh, first and greatest of commandments, as it was the tradition of uh, many, uh, that we can utter these last words, perhaps as the last breath that we take. So that is uh, the Shema, and this is our website, which is not working, apologies. So we've had some uh, glitches here at uh, RF Central. As you can see, um, you cannot access it right now, but uh, we have our, our friends and uh, supporters, um, especially Lori, who very, uh, we thank her for, for doing this uh, service, but we are getting it back online soon. So our apologies for now. So this morning we'll read from a PDF we have here and um, Anthony will continue our reading of the second letter to Timothy from Paul. And uh, let's see, so I'll put it up there on the screen. And before we begin, Anthony, good morning to you. Yeah, and it's good on the Shema to remind us that that is the most important commandment of all Jesus said. Well, you wouldn't think so from going to churches generally. How often have you had sermons on the Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad? There's no difficulty with that at all. God is one person, one Lord, one person. Since the age of two or three, you've been saying that to your children. Nobody has the slightest difficulty in understanding the word one. So bear that in mind, teach your children, never to forget that God is one single Lord. He's not a what. <laughs> I'm hearing out there that God is three who's in one what, and I say what? That is offensive to Jewish people. It's offensive to anybody who's a good Bible student. 
God is not a what. If he were a what, he'd be a thing. Well, that's absurd. He's a father 1,300 times in the New Testament scriptures, New Covenant scriptures, we might say, God is called the Father. That's not so hard. So I want you to approach religion with an inquisitive mind. I want you to say, have I been possibly deceived? And we'll go into that a little bit more in connection with Second uh, Timothy 4 in a moment. Okay, what else, Carlos? We're going to start then. All right. Yeah, that's that's it. Uh, that's it. Just yep. try and keep your comments in the chat, please, to the yep. main sermon here. And uh, take it away, Anthony. Right. So, chapter 4 of Second Timothy. I want to tell you that Jesus and Paul were absolutely one-track people. They concentrate on what is really essentially a simple message, which we in churches over these 2,000 years have really made a mess of. Now, I'm not trying to be critical in a harsh way. I'm only trying to point you to facts. The fact is that Jesus was a preacher of what's called the gospel about the kingdom. And you don't hear that phrase, gospel of the kingdom all the time in church. Why not? This should get you thinking. You should invite your preacher, pastor, to speak to you on the gospel about the kingdom. And so my summary point for the day would be simply this, that what has happened to churches is you've substituted the word heaven for kingdom. You keep telling people that when you die, you will pass away, that's the language which is absolutely false to the Bible, and pass away. You go to the grave until the resurrection, and at the resurrection, which will occur at the future second coming of Jesus, you'll be raised from a state of unconsciousness in death. So nobody's playing a harp in heaven now. Nobody will ever play harps in heaven as a reward. That's not the reward. But you will be brought back to life. <coughs> Excuse me. And that, of course, is the framework within which Jesus worked. And as we're going to see here, the framework within which Paul worked all the time. I'm going to suggest a slightly clearer translation then. In 2 Timothy 4 verse 1, Paul is not here charging, making a kind of an oath statement. I've translated as follows, and I think I can justify that. There are many who understand what I'm saying here. Paul said this, before God and Messiah Jesus, God is the Father. He's the only one who is true God. John 17, 3. That is what we would call Jewish Christian monotheism. It's Christian because that's what Jesus believed in Mark 12. When asked about the most important commandment of all, the one you mustn't get wrong, on pain of death, on pain of losing your salvation, you mustn't get it wrong. God is the Father. And so, in the presence of God, with God and Messiah Jesus watching him, Paul goes to repeating in these last words of his writing career, the things which were absolutely essential. And here they are, God and Messiah Jesus. Why does he say Messiah Jesus? Well, because we, in our ignorance really, have made a mess of the title. We talk about Jesus Christ as though Christ is really a family name, which is completely false. It's his title. It means King Jesus. All of the kings were anointed ones, and Messiah simply means anointed with the oil of God. These are God's kings, and Jesus is the supreme royal ruler of the coming kingdom. And that's what the Messiah Jesus is going to do, along with God, his Father. They're going to judge, and particularly the Messiah, who is going to return to do this, is going to judge the living and the dead. The word judge in the New Testament can be tricky. I want you to understand that to judge somebody is not simply just to condemn them or criticize them, but it has the connotation of ruling and reigning. 
Don't you know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 6, 2, and if you're taking notes, I hope you'll take note of some of these verses in order that you can share these truths, to use the American expression, share them, teach these truths to other people who desperately need them. To judge is to rule. And so Jesus is going to rule the world in the future. And he's also going to deal with the dead who will be resurrected in the future. Here is the translation that I suggest is correct here. I, Paul, he says, solemnly testify. That word, via matetirome, nice word in Greek. I solemnly testify means I make an appeal to you with absolute solemnity, with absolute emphasis. In other words, I'm underlining this 17 times in various colors because this is the part you mustn't miss. Messiah Jesus is going to rule the world. He's going to rule and deal with the living and the dead when they're resurrected. And he then solemnly testifies. And I was Paul is saying, I cannot underline the importance more than I'm trying to do here. So we are adding to that emphasis by saying, we also solemnly tell you on the evidence of God and Jesus about the future appearing of Jesus. The Greek word for his second coming is his parousia. It doesn't vaguely mean presence, much less as the Jehovah's Witnesses used to say, does it mean 1914? That's absolute total nonsense. The second coming is future to us still. It's the reappearance of Jesus, his second appearance, because he appeared once, as we know in history, 2000 years ago. And when he appears in the future, that's going to bring in his kingdom. If you wanted a simple summary of the whole of the Bible, it's all about the kingdom. It's all about the kingdom. It's all about the kingdom. Why is that so? Because in Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. And it turned out to be a disaster when Adam and Eve fell for the clever lies of the devil. This is the beginning of a ruinous human history. You know, the first 11 chapters of Genesis are a disaster. You have the Tower, the tower of Babel. You have all sorts of awful things happening. Now, Jesus, from his early ages, age of his early age of, of, rainy, of uh, reading the scriptures, said, my goodness, you know what? I am the king whom God has appointed to turn all of that awful stuff in Genesis back to where it should be. And so restoration, recovery, getting rid of the misery, the destruction, which we see currently on our news uh, screens, Jesus saw that he was the Messiah, the anointed king. It's a royal story from start to finish. Jesus recognized that he was going to be the king of that kingdom. And he said, you know what? I'm going to have some kings and rulers to rule and reign and recover and restore the world with me. So that's what I'm going to do when I preach my gospel. I'm going to sow the seed of the kingdom. Nothing about going to heaven when you die. Forget all of that. That's just wrong. So he makes his kingdom statement. And I want to refer as we go through these kingdom statement verses that I want to ask you that you keep chapter 8 of Luke in mind. Very easy to remember. 8 is the number of Jesus, a very special number, one above seven. And in Luke 8, the parable of the sower is everything. If you haven't got the parable of the sower down, if you're not hearing sermons on that all the time, you're not getting the story. So he's appealing now to the gospel. That's the gospel being defined as the gospel of the kingdom. And he gives his final command then in verse 2 to his disciple Timothy. He's very proud of Timothy. Timothy was a bright convert under Paul's teaching. And here's what he says to Timothy. Here's what he says to you if you're claiming to be a follower of Jesus. Herald the gospel. That is, get a trumpet, put it to your mouth and blow it loud and proclaim the peace of the coming kingdom, P-E-A-C-E. 
the restoration, the end of Hamas, the end of his hostility, the end of guns and warfare and all the chaos and destruction we now see, herald that gospel and in verse 2 of my translation, I think, herald the gospel. The Greek there simply says the word. Ask your friends, what's the word? And they'll say, what's the Bible? No, no, no. Much too vague. It's the word about the kingdom, Matthew 13, 19. These are the verses you're going to need to instruct people on how to read the Bible intelligently. The seed is the word of the kingdom, Matthew 13, 19. Why do you think that the parable of the sower is repeated three times? Why do you think Matthew, Mark, and Luke are almost verbatim repeats of the same thing? Because that's the part you mustn't miss. God is very smart in the matter of emphasis. And most important things are underlined and repeated. So preach the word means preach and announce the gospel of the kingdom. Yeah. Is that all right, Carlos? Yeah, uh, I'm just reminded while you're speaking mm. on that, Anthony, to um, share this, uh, what we call dictionary, the Sound Doctrine Dictionary on our blog. And it's about these code words uh, compiled by Sarah here, the defining text, the faith, the truth. Uh, we're still in Timothy. So Paul uses this type of language a lot as you can see there and we also have what we call the Pauline Kingdom Gospel Dictionary I'll put the links in the chat and these are again code words for the gospel about the coming kingdom as uh, Luke tells us uh, throughout the book of Acts with the eight kingdom texts as you call them so you have the promise the blessing uh, immortality and so on Anthony just as okay, very good. I'm so glad you put that up. I was going to ask you, it's, it's providential that you put that up. I was going to ask you to put that right up. And so that will take us immediately to a memory verse that I want you to memorize forever today and use it all the time. That would be Luke chapter 8, verse 8. Paul is now reflecting in his letter, 2 Timothy, all of the preaching and teaching of Jesus. So if you've been told that Jesus only preached to Jews, that's not for you. You've been lied to. You've been given a ghastly piece of fake news. The fact is that Jesus himself said, the parable of the sower is the most important parable of all, the one you mustn't miss, like the great commandment defining God. So in Luke 8, verse 8, this is for your notes now, in connection with Paul's emphasis on, here's what you've got to do, Timothy, Here's what Jesus said in Luke 8, 8. I found this quite fascinating. Luke 8, 8, you'll find that when Jesus had given the parable of the sower, the image, you know, from sowing a seed, you have to sow a seed to produce a plant. When he'd finished giving that parable in Luke 8, verse 8, easy to remember because 8, 8, 8 is the number of Jesus numerically. I'm not obsessed with numbers, but it's interesting that 888 is the value of the name of Jesus or Jesus. Well, in Luke 8, 8, very easy to remember, it says this, as he got to describing the parable of the sower, Jesus said to them, he who has ears to hear, for goodness sake, listen. But he didn't just say, listen. It says in Luke 8, 8, that when he got to this verse, when he got to this part of the story, he used to yell. I'm fascinated by the fact that Jesus raised his voice and shouted. Why do you think he did that? Because he knew that's the part that probably the public is forgetting, the public being vague, and as I was in my Church of England days, almost totally uninstructed. So Jesus used to yell, Luke 8.8, 8. he customarily shouted, for maximum emphasis, and I'm trying to re reproduce that now, if you're hearing this, for goodness sake, hear. Why? Because it's a matter of life or death. Let me put this to you. A lot of salvation language out there in religion land is false. It promises you something it isn't going to bring forth as a result. You're being asked to accept Jesus in your heart. What does that mean? Almost nothing. Oh, I got born again when I was six. What? Wait a minute. The 
program by which you get born again, by which you get saved, is laid out in the parable of the sower. You've got to hear the message of the kingdom to get on the track. And I'll mention, since we're doing numbers today, Luke 8.8, 8, then I'll mention to you Acts 8.12, where it says that when they preached, when Philip preached in Samaria, guess what he preached? First of all, the gospel of the kingdom. So if you're not hearing that phrase, gospel of the kingdom, all the time, day after day, Sunday after Sunday, you're not really hearing the voice of Jesus clearly. So please remember Acts 8, 12, when they preached the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus, everything to do with his death and resurrection, of course, all of the things to do with Jesus, but starting with the kingdom, then they were being baptized. Water baptism is a command, not an option. It's a command. But now, Acts 8.12 is most useful because it should remind you of Luke 8.12 in the very parable of the sower we're referring to in connection with 2 Timothy chapter 4. In Luke 8.12, listen to this now. Jesus there said, whenever you hear the gospel, which is the gospel about the kingdom, Matthew 13, 19, now what happens? How many of you could finish this verse if I didn't tell you? Probably not too many. You should know this verse like you know the Lord is my shepherd. Jesus said, when anybody is exposed to the gospel about the kingdom of God, the devil, listen carefully, the devil is there to snatch away that message of the kingdom from your mind. Why? So that you would not believe it and what? Be clever? No, no, be saved. Wow. That is devastatingly interesting. Jesus, the theology of Jesus is fascinating. He makes everything depend on your uh, intelligent reception of the gospel of the kingdom. And the devil knows that very well. He doesn't want you hearing the gospel of the kingdom. That's why I'm raising my voice now. I'm getting excited because I want you to understand the gospel of the kingdom and to preach it everywhere. And that's exactly what Paul said in 2 Timothy 4. Timothy, my beloved son, the one that I instructed in the gospel, I want you now to teach the gospel of the kingdom everywhere. I make this solemn announcement to you along those lines. So preach that kingdom. If you're not preaching the gospel of the kingdom, if you're not hearing that kingdom word constantly in the preaching you're being exposed to, I suggest that you might consider that you are being deceived. So that's why the importance of this lesson is so pronounced for me. Preach that word. The word. The word of the kingdom. Don't ever say word without saying the word of the kingdom. You've been taught vaguely to say, well, the word means the Bible. That's not wrong, but it's not accurate. It's inaccurate. It's vague. The devil is a master of vagueness. He wants you to be unclear on these things. I want you to be clear about this. So preach that gospel word. In my translation, I actually added the word gospel word because that's what Paul meant there. He didn't vaguely say, preach the Bible and hope for the best. Preach the gospel of the kingdom. Persist, Timothy, my student, my former student, persist with this preaching of the gospel word of the kingdom, whether it happens to be convenient or inconvenient. And here's what you're to do when you do this, this preaching of the gospel of the kingdom. Correct people, rebuke them, Exhort them with all patience in teaching. Interesting. If you're going to teach the Bible, and every one of you listening this morning should have some part in that, not all of you are going to be formal, full-time teachers, I understand that, but at every opportunity you should be dropping hints and other indications of the gospel of the kingdom. Any form of communication of the gospel would have to require your use of the gospel of the kingdom language. And in so doing, you're rebuking and correcting and exhorting and encouraging anybody who happens to be within listening distance of your words. And you're to do it with ultimate patience. Why is that? Ultimate patience. You better be ready to be opposed. You'd better be ready to be 
challenged, argued against, and you'd better have the right arguments to make your point. Here's what Paul said in verse 3. For, that little word for, har in Greek, G-A-R, means this is what I mean. This is what I mean. It unpacks what you've just said. The time is approaching, Paul said, way back in the first century, when people, men and women, will not put up with sound health-giving teachings. The true teachings of the truth about the gospel of the kingdom and things concerning Jesus, Acts 8, 12, are health-giving. Your brain likes them. You're going to feel better. Your health is going to be better. And above all, you're going to, you're going to be winning in the race that leads to the kingdom. Sound teachings. Sarah was rightly talking about being a Berean. The Bereans were more noble. That's an elegant word. That's a fine word. They were intelligent in the best sense. Wise, good people. Why? Because they searched the Bible, the scriptures daily to see if what Paul was saying was true. And that's what we should be doing. The time is coming and the time, believe me, has come. The whole history of 2,000 years of corruption, of watering down, of making Jesus into an un-Jewish Jesus, turning him into a Gentile, promoting immortal souls going to heaven, which is completely foreign to the Bible. All of that has now happened. You're living in a world in which people have been deceived and are not being good Bereans. The time has now come when people will not put up, they will not stand health-giving teachings. But instead of that, Paul makes his point now uh, more clearly than ever, they're going to be amassing for themselves, that's that word amass, a pileup of huge numbers of teachers. And if you could just remove that thing from the screen, we can read, uh, Carlos, please. Uh, I, I'm blocked in my reading on the screen there. Uh, where are you blocked? I don't know. Uh, verse three. I've got something covering. All right, let me can let we me un read it? Oh um, no, it's no, it's all right. Sorry, it was my own fault. Sorry, I oh, had okay. my I had something on there, but I've got okay. it now beautifully. All right, the time is approaching. Paul said, when people will not stand for uh, good teaching, but they will amass, they will pile up majority for themselves teachers to satisfy their itching ears. Watch out now, because you and I are members of the public. We could have been taken in here. They, these unfortunate people, will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into fables and myths. Now, you could be in that category. Don't assume that you asked Jesus into your heart and that was enough. It wasn't. If you weren't exposed to the gospel of the kingdom, then you were not submitted to the parable of the sower where Jesus shouted at us to say, don't miss this, Luke 8, verse 8. So let's take the warning very seriously. That time has certainly come. People have employed teachers. They go to church. They pay the pastor to teach them not necessarily are they receiving the truth of the Bible? You've got to be critical. You've got to be um, discriminating. All right, so then in verse uh, four, they will turn away their ears from the truth. I'm so glad that Carlos put earlier on the screen that wonderful vocabulary list of synonymous code words. I've said this to you often. How many words can you misunderstand in what people are saying before you don't get it? The answer is not many. Language has to be clear. And unfortunately, even in the Unitarian community, which I'm part, people are falling for palpable falsehoods, egregious falsehoods, like, for example, that the millennium is now going. Come on now. There's no millennium going. If you think that the devil has been bound so he cannot deceive the nations, you've been terribly deceived. You've been egregiously deceived. Turn around, 
and admit that the millennium is in the future. The thousand year reign, which is the grand and glorious climax of the gospel, the whole story, the climax of the whole story from where we went wrong in Genesis to where we go right at the end, that whole story is summed up in the millennium there. And to get that wrong is to throw away billions of dollars of truth. Don't do it. So Paul says, herald that gospel word because people are not going to want to hear the truth. You're going to have to work at it with patience. They'll turn away their truth and they'll wander off into myth. You might say they'll get a rejected Jesus and a twisted Paul. The tendency in churches is not to preach from Matthew, Mark, and Luke as much as you should. Oh, we like Paul. Well, Paul is more twistable. Paul assumes a lot of things in his writings that you're supposed to understand. But if you're not grounded in the teaching of Jesus, you are liable to have been deceived. But the instructions to Timothy are impassioned here. He would say, I think, the same sort of thing today if he rose and saw the mass chaos of thousands of different denominations all disagreeing with each other. They will turn away, in verse 4, from listening to the truth, that's the truth of the gospel of the kingdom. So you fill in the words there. For instance, when you learn about the promise in the New Testament, you always want to say the promise to Abraham that he would be heir of the world. Let me fill it out even more. The promise to Abraham and his descendants that they would be heirs of the world. Fill in the code words because your children need to hear them all the time. You, Timothy, here are instructions in verse 5. Keep a clear head. Be sure you know what you're saying. When you say God, if you mean a triune God, you're not talking about the God of the Bible. If when you say gospel, you say, well, it means that Jesus died and rose and that's it, then you haven't got it yet. Keep a clear head. Talk about the gospel of the kingdom and do the Shema the declaration by Jesus himself agreeing with a friend of you that God is one single person. There we have it. Now, Paul then talks of himself. I, Paul, in verse 6, am already being poured out like a drink offering. The Bible is full of brilliant comparisons. It talks about trees clapping their hands, the leaves of the trees clapping their hands. You watch the trees in the wind. It looks as though they're clapping, they're applauding, they're falling, of course, at this time of year. Brilliant analogy. Paul says, I'm like a drink offering being poured out. I'm being sacrificed for the sake of my allegiance to the truth. That's what he's claiming here as a model for his precious student, namely Timothy. Yes, Carlos, what are you going to say? Uh, if I may, Anthony, yeah. just address a Facebook uh, comment. Yes, please. Uh, only a few days before Golgotha, Jesus announced that he would die and rise again. The whole gospel is about the kingdom. Yes. Yes, so we uh, we call ourselves focus on the kingdom or the, mm. you know, our various sites. Yeah. Um, but I would also stress the fact that uh, the obvious, the obvious death and resurrection yes, of obvious. Jesus Central. is part of yes, the gospel cool. message. Cool. So, although we may sound yeah. kingdom-centered only, if yeah. you will, but obviously, just to address this comment, and if you want to add to the fact that yes. the gospel is about the kingdom and the things regarding the Messiah. Absolutely right. It's a fair point. In order to balance what we feel is the lack in public preaching, we are stressing the kingdom. I've often uh, mentioned that there is a large evangelical system out there who says the following. I quote, Jesus came to do three days work. To die, to be buried, and to be raised. I say that is absolutely false because if you accept that as the gospel, the entirety of it, you've left Jesus out. That's the one thing you cannot afford to do. 
Paul is trying to tell Timothy and all of the Bible ad adheres to this point that the words of Jesus, do you remember the voice from heaven when Jesus was on earth? This is my beloved son, Jesus. For goodness sake, listen to what he's saying. And he wasn't initially talking about his death. Of course, Carlos is right. We're not for a moment suggesting that the crucifixion, the burial of Jesus is unimportant. It's absolutely central. In other words, if that was not being preached, we would have to emphasize it. But the fact is that the first half of the gospel, the kingdom gospel, is almost absent from public preaching. And your job is to help to restore that balance. Yeah, I mean, that's why you found that Restoration Fellowship. We're yes. trying to restore what we understand to be biblical, in this case, New Testament, um, New Testament sound doctrine, sound teaching, as Paul calls it. And just as a reminder, so this is the text I was alluding to. Uh, so you have this story in Acts chapter 8 about Simon the sorcerer. And um, it goes on to say when they believed Philip, so people who listened to Philip, as he preached the good news or the gospel of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized men and women. So this is a good sort of um, evangelistic tool, missionary tool. We used this in uh, Central America when we... Yeah. Did our mission trips, Anthony? And if you want to talk more on Acts 8 12. Well, that's wonderful. The uh, Abrahamic people, so called in the 1830s, discovered these verses. They said, My goodness, there's a good summary statement. And so I'm saying to you who may be listening this morning, if you're not using this verse, you haven't really got off the ground. Along with Luke 4:43 for your notes, which says, Jesus said there. I came to preach the gospel about the kingdom. That's what I was sent to do. Did you hear that? That's Christianity. Luke 4, verse 43, along with Acts 8, 12. If we haven't got the central point, we haven't got anything. And we're in danger of having been deceived. And another part of what I wanted to say today is if you look at Jesus' level of intolerance, he's extremely intolerant. I won't go... Uh, this morning to Luke chapter uh, 13, but there I'll refer to it only. Somebody asked him, Jesus, are many people going to be saved or is it few? And he said, few people are going to be saved. He even said, I'm not even sure the faith is going to exist when I come back. He wondered about it. Then he went on to say that many, the multitude, the majority, the vast majority of people will say in the future judgment, Lord, Lord, look what we did. You preached in our streets. We went to church, in Christian churches. All of that only to be greeted with the mind-numbing words, get out of here, I never knew you. I want you to take in the degree of the intolerance of Jesus this morning. You've got to get this right on pain of salvation. These are not doctrinal things to be argued about in some academic, non-practical way. These are issues of whether you get to live forever or not. Is that clear? Whether you get to live forever, whether you get to be saved, or you get to be kicked out of the kingdom at the banquet. So that's another subject for another day, but that's what we're alluding to this morning as well. Paul is being poured out as a drink offering. He gave himself relentlessly, doggedly, to the preaching of the gospel of the kingdom and the name of Jesus. The time of his departure, this is getting straightforward now, he means his death. You depart from this life. When you come into life, you're born. That's coming into the world. That's the biblical phrase for being born, naturally enough. And when you depart from this life, you die. You lose, lose this, you leave this life. It doesn't mean you have an immortal soul, heaven forbid. That's a pagan idea to the core. Nobody passes away and goes to heaven as an immortal soul. That is rank paganism and will not do anything to help you in salvation. But Paul is very confident of what he's done. This is a man, you'll remember, who tried to murder Christians. 
Paul, I repeat, was a zealous Pharisee, highly religious, taught by Gamaliel, one of the chief Jewish teachers of the day, and he wanted Christians dead. Your news screens are filled with people waving banners. Have you noticed? They want certain people dead. Well, Paul was in that awful crowd of people wanting Jesus dead until on the Damascus Road he had a blinding light change his life. And after that, and he got to the end of his own life when he was ready to depart from this life and go to sleep in the sleep of death in the grave, he was able to say, I fought the good fight. Fought the good fight. You, if you're a Christian believer, are fighting a good fight. You're running a race and it's not an easy one. So the idea that you just ask Jesus into your heart is dangerously false. It gives you a false impression. Jesus rather said, strive, agonize, struggle to go in by the narrow gate because wide and broad is the large gate and the majority of people are going to think they're Christians and are not and will be terribly disappointed. Yeah, what else? Yeah, Anthony, uh, apologies. No, no, Just no, good. One, well, wanted to um, uh, read something from Ryrie, a uh, study Bible, on verse 6, the pouring out like a drink offering. So uh, Ryrie views this as uh, Paul talking about his coming death, which is, uh, so his life is like pouring out like a drink a drink offering to God. And Ryrie notes that the drink offering considered of about two pints of unmixed wine was poured on the grain offering as a symbol of joy as part of the feast of first fruits. I'm sure you're familiar with. You can maybe educate us more on that. And the first fruit symbolized the consecration of the entire harvest to God and was an earnest uh, or pledge, an earnest pledge yes. of the full harvest yet to be gathered. Um, yes. Just from Ryrie there. Yeah, well, that's exactly right. An earnest is a noun in itself, and a pledge is a noun. It means a guarantee of something that you're going to get a greater uh, measure of in the future. So we do have the earnest, that's a noun in English, and you have the uh, promise and the pledge, the down payment of the future kingdom life that we're looking forward to. You get it right now. Once you receive the gospel of the kingdom as the parable and Luke 8, 8, where Jesus shouted customarily, Luke records in Luke 8, 8, I'm repeating it for emphasis. Luke is said to tell us that Jesus yelled in Luke 8, 8, because this was an issue of salvation. And indeed, Paul expected the reader to know what a drink offering to God was. But Ryrie's comment is most useful. This is a glorious song of success. I've made it. I've fought the good fight. I've run the race. I've completed the race. You are in a race. The idea that you, once you say, I've asked Jesus into my heart, you're saved, is absolutely false. I repeat, false. Because salvation in the Bible has a beginning, a middle, and an end. We were saved. In one sense, we are being saved in another sense. And more fully and most emphatically, we're going to be saved if we keep running the race at the end, if we strive, struggle to enter in by the narrow gate. And many, Jesus said, will think they were come, going to be in and they'll be terribly, shatteringly disappointed when they see Abraham, and quoting Jesus now, when they see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in that future kingdom and all the prophets and themselves claiming to have been Christians, kicked out. That's the lesson for today, most important. All right, so what else have we got here? Demas has deserted me. Do you think that the Christian life is a bed of roses? I wouldn't think so. Demas has deserted Paul. He gave up on the faith because of his love of the present age. He loved the present system, the riches of the present system, the illicit practices of the present system where all sorts of sexual deviations 
are pronounced to be okay when they're not. Demas went off to Thessalonica. Crescens went to Galatia, whether in good faith, uh, in, in good shape, it doesn't say, but they left Paul, so he was on his own. Only brother Luke, so to speak, is with me. Luke wrote more of the New Testament than any other writer. He's probably the only Gentile amongst all the Jewish writers, but his writings are exceedingly important because he wrote the history of the life of Jesus, and then he did a second volume called the Gospel of Acts. So if you haven't read the eight kingdom texts in Acts, you haven't got started. If you don't know what Luke 4.43 is, I say with respect and humor, you haven't really got started yet. There are the eight kingdom texts. You should have all of those memorized immediately. You can do no evangelism without those kingdom gospel texts in the book of Acts. Um, sorry, Anthony. Yes, uh, ahead, we skipped uh, the very important yes. verse eight. Yes. There is reserved for me for the future Wonderful. the crown of uprightness, which the Lord, yes. the upright judge, will award to me on that day. Yes. Yes. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. One more. Thank you so much. I, I should not have left that out for a second. So having fought the good fight, he's confident he has, about to die. He's completed the race, kept the faith. The faith, the faith is the gospel of the kingdom in the name of Jesus. That's to say Acts 8.12. That's to say Luke 8.8. 8. So now with that confidence in mind, there is reserved for me, waiting for me, the future crown, that's a royal word, of uprightness, which the Lord Jesus, I've chosen to put a lowercase l there, not the Lord God, but although, of course, he would agree with Jesus, the Father and the Son work together in perfect harmony, which the Lord Jesus here, who is the upright judge. The Bible, I've said it often, is a legal book. The judge, the ultimate decider of whether you get to live forever or whether you don't, that's no small deal, by the way. And that judge, the Lord Jesus, is going to award, and I might say reward. It was Calvin who is so damaging. John Calvin, who doesn't think that human beings can ever do anything right. They're always wrong. They're always miserable sinners. They always get it wrong. Absolutely false. Paul has a very positive view of what he's been able to achieve, and he's going to get a reward for this. Many of the parables talk about paying you for what you've done. That's not wrong. Well done. I remind you of the words of Jesus. Well done, you good and faithful servant. Inherit the kingdom. That's not a small deal. To inherit the kingdom is to own the world. Fear not, little flock. I remind you in Luke 12, the father is thrilled to pieces, my paraphrase, to give you the world. What? I didn't learn that in church. I was told that if I was good on my own terms, I would go to heaven, strum a harp in the sky. That is a falsehood and a fake lying nonsense that made the Bible completely inaccessible. So only Luke, brother Luke, wrote more of the New Testament than any other of the writers is still with me. And he tells him, pick up Mark. That's the mark of the Gospel of Mark, who learned his material from Peter, incidentally. Bring him with you, because he's very useful to me in ministry. I like the, the appreciation of Paul for others here. He says he's very useful. He can really help me in the ministry. And here's what I've done. The Apostle Paul, I've sent Tychicus to Ephesus. Uh, we have some very interesting uh, geographic maps written by Unitarians even today, most useful resources. Look these places up. When you come, Timothy, please bring the cloak. We're getting to winter. I need that cloak. and I left it in Troas with Carpus, as well as the scrolls, which no doubt were Paul's letters and became scripture and are now scripture for us, particularly the parchments. Very practical. But now look at the downside of Christianity. Alexander the coppersmith, he names him, did me an awful lot of harm. Didn't Jesus said, don't be surprised or in any way put out 
or unnerved by the fact that if you have the truth, the world's going to hate you. The world is going to hate you because the devil is behind the thinking of the world and the devil is absolutely opposed to the truth of the gospel of the kingdom. Paul was on trial, twice in fact, finally tried by Rome and probably beheaded. Probably died for the faith. At my first trial, nobody stood by me. I was there alone, defending myself. They all deserted me. These were Christian people, supposedly, but they all failed. Let's hope they recovered. And Paul then very generously, I love this phrase here, may this not be counted against them. Isn't that interesting? I'm just hoping that God will not hold them guilty for the awful sin they committed against me by deserting me. However, the Lord Jesus stood with me in that condition and gave me strength so that through me, the proclamation, that's the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom. You always want to say gospel of the kingdom. You always want to say our gospel of the kingdom, gospel of the kingdom. Repeat it forever until people get this clear because it's not clear to them now. The proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom might be accomplished for all the Gentiles to hear. There's only one saving gospel. One of the great falsehoods that might have come your way is that the gospel of the kingdom was only for Jews. That is completely fatal and false. There's one gospel of the kingdom and things concerning Jesus, Acts 8, 12, which applies equally to those whom Jesus preached it to. And Jesus sent the disciples out to preach both to Jews and later to Gentiles. Paul especially preached to Gentiles, but the same gospel is the gospel of the kingdom. And all the Gentiles are meant to hear it. This is not a small deal. We're talking here about are you going to live forever or are you going to be extinguished in death and the lake of fire from which there is no recovery? That's the end of everything. You're going to be burned up, not tortured forever in hellfire. That's another myth to get rid of. But the wicked will be exterminated, not permitted to live forever. That's what we're talking about here. Yes, Carlos. Yeah, sorry, Anthony. No, go, no, go ahead. Just to bring up um, a footnote here you have on verse 9 for the present age, as you see there, as you translated it. You have a footnote. The present evil age is the ongoing age until the second coming or the affirmation appearing, uh, which will herald, which will begin the judgment of the living and the dead, uh, when he will introduce his revolutionary world government, that is Jesus, the kingdom of God on a renewed earth. Now, the reason I want to highlight this, Anthony. Yes is because uh, so many Christians are teaching or being taught yep. that the age to come, that the kingdom is now, mm. yet we are in this present evil age, Paul says. So yep. those two things cannot be coexisting at the same time. You're absolutely right. They cannot. And let's try to correct that error once and for all. In Revelation 12, verse 9, you'll read that the devil... The ancient serpent, which wasn't really a literal snake, it was the devil pictured as a snake there. That devil, according to Revelation 12, verse 9, is currently deceiving the entire world. 1 John 5, 19 says the same thing, that the devil is deceiving the entire world. Is that clear? He's deceiving almost the entire world with the exception of a few believers of the truth, true Christians. That's Revelation 12 and 9. But in Revelation 20, the famous passage about the millennium, that word for thousand years, occurs six times there. It's the grand and glorious climax of the whole story from Genesis onwards. And guess what? Some people are saying that that thousand-year reign, which is marked by the time when the devil is going to be bound, locked up with a key in the abyss 
unable to deceive the nations any longer, some people are daring to say that that has happened. What? If you think the devil has been locked up in a subterranean area, locked up so that he cannot deceive the nations any longer, I'm quoting scripture there, you are very egregiously, badly deceived. And I would invite you to repent of that and, say, and apologize to God for having created a massive confusion. No, no, the devil is currently the god of this current age. He's deceiving the whole nation, the whole of the nations, Revelation 12, verse 9, in that future millennium, which isn't now. If you say it's now, you're confusing God with the devil. You're confusing truth with error. You're showing that you haven't understood the gospel well at all. And that's the time to repent and beg God for forgiveness and get this right. So I'm glad we mentioned that point. Yes. And uh, to something else on verse 11. Mm. Uh, he says, Paul, only Luke is with me. Pick up Mark, bring him with you, because be, he is very useful to me in ministry. Now, uh, Ryrie and other commentaries or study Bibles uh, say that this is the same Mark that Paul apparently had a falling out with uh, back in Acts 15, if I may read that. So this is the Jerusalem council afterwards. It says, uh, after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let's return, visit the brothers and sisters in every city in which we proclaim the word of the Lord, that is the gospel about the kingdom, and see how they are. Barnabas wanted to take John, called Mark, along with them also, but Paul was of the opinion that they should not take along with them this man who had deserted them and had not gone with them to the work in Pamphylia. Now it turned into such a sharp disagreement that they separated from one another and Barnabas took Mark, who's also known as John apparently, with him and sailed away to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and left after being entrusted by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he was traveling through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches there. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. So they did disagree with each other. They weren't in perfect harmony. But Mark, if I'm understanding rightly from Ryrie's comment there, that is the Mark, John Mark, who wrote the gospel. Am I right? Um, As he said. Not sure if it's the same uh, gospel writer, but he mm -hmm. does, uh, or some identify this Mark in, in Second Timothy. Yes. As perhaps that same Mark. So Okay. Anyway. Well, Mark, of course, turned out, if this was the same man, turned out to be very strong, very important. Peter was his teacher, and he wrote the Gospel of Mark, which, of course, is a vital and essential part of Christian teaching, the Gospels, and begins with the beginning of the Gospel, which is the Gospel of the Kingdom. So if you've learned anything from this morning's activities, it would be that the Gospel must not be compromised confused, muddled, watered down, because if it is, you're liable to lose your salvation because it's by believing the gospel of the kingdom and things concerning Jesus in Acts 8, 12. It's by believing that, by saying to God, yes, I believe it. This is the purpose for which man was created. It's the recovery of what happened in Genesis. The first Adam failed dismally. The second Adam Jesus succeeded brilliantly by recognizing that the kingdom had been given to mankind from the start, but we messed it up so badly we lost it. So fear not, little flock, it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom is the positive side. It could not be stressed more because of the absence. I wouldn't stress this to the extent to which I'm trying to stress it this morning, if this was common knowledge, but it isn't. Ask your friends in a polite way, by the way, what's the gospel? And if they say, well, it's the gospel of the kingdom, they're very exceptional because they've been misled, deceived by a system which gives you half the gospel, the all essential death and resurrection of Jesus, all essential, that part you've been given. 
but the element of the kingdom which precedes it, you most likely have not been given clearly. Therefore, Luke 8, verse 8, Jesus shouted and yelled when he got to the parable of the sower, which is all about the fate of the seed, which is the word of the kingdom. If you haven't got the seed word of the kingdom sown in you, you're not going anywhere. You're likely to be deceived. And the majority, Jesus said, actually three quarters, think of this in the parable of the sower, three quarters of the four categories there listed failed. They were failed Christians. They started well, they got the kingdom message, but three quarters, 75%, according to Jesus, failed to end the race and to gain the life of the age to come. That's quite a sobering thought, isn't it? I would have thought that would call you to a greater sense of urgency in regard to saying, have I understood the kingdom gospel or haven't I? Maybe I haven't. Maybe I've been deceived. Go back to the parable of the sower in Luke 8, Mark 4, and Matthew 13. Repeated three times. I remind you again that Mark records that if you don't, un Jesus said, if you don't get this parable, you haven't got any of them. That's interesting. If you haven't understood that 75% of those who start well actually fail. That's not what you get from TV evangelists who say, bow your head and pray God, and nothing you would do after that could possibly distract you. That is false. Struggle to enter by the narrow gate, because wide and broad is the gate that leads to destruction, to failure, and many, many people enter by that. Those are the verses which, alas, have to be preached with conviction do you want to finish up the letter here we're in uh, absolutely please seven, I would love to. 17. 17 the lord jesus stood with me paul speaking here strengthened me so do we believe in miracles absolutely i don't think we have apostolic miracles because you know it does say paul said that god has placed in the church apostles well where are they show me if there are apostles with the capital A in the church, where are they? I don't think we have them, but that's not to say that God doesn't work miraculously in our lives in many different ways, in healing, if necessary, various things. But I wouldn't claim that we have the miraculous signs of apostles with a capital A, because to be an apostle with a capital A, you must have seen Jesus alive and I don't think you have. So let's make allowance for the fact that we're not living in those apostolic sign demonstrating times. That does not mean, I repeat, that does not mean that God doesn't work miraculously in various ways in our lives. So Paul is confident here. Verse 17, the Lord stood with me, strengthened me. That certainly can happen today. So that through me, the proclamation, and you should add, the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom. The promise to Abraham and his seed that they would be heirs of the world. You want to fill in the other words, if only because the public doesn't know them well. The proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom might be fully accomplished. That's what he prayed for in those opening verses that we did to start with. Preaching about the kingdom solemnly. and. What happened was the Gentiles heard that gospel from Paul's lips and I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. You know, the lion and the bear are the two threatening animals. The lion is a furious, uh, deadly enemy. So is a bear. And Paul was rescued. And the Lord will continue to rescue me, in verse 18, from every evil 18 there we have it and will save me future tense he did save me in the future in the past rather he is saving me now most important salvation is in the future will save me by bringing me into his heavenly kingdom which is not and i think you all know this nothing to do with going to heaven 
it's a heavenly kingdom. It's a kingdom of heaven, as Matthew alone calls it. And Matthew sometimes calls it the kingdom of God. There is no difference at all between them. The kingdom is going to come from heaven when Jesus comes from heaven at the second appearing or coming of Jesus. So that's verse 17 and 18. To him be the glory. The word glory, by the way, is often a synonym for the kingdom. I'll add this. If you're not defining the kingdom from the book of Daniel, you haven't got started. If you think that kingdom in the New Testament vaguely means kingship, some abstract title without a territory and so on, then you've been very badly misled. Daniel is the basis, and uh, along with the Hebrew Bible, for defining the kingdom. That's what the whole Bible is looking forward to. The reason for that is simple. We went wrong in Genesis. In the beginning, the heavens and the earth. We're looking for a new, a renewed heavens and earth. God is so excited about this that he sent his apostles and he sent Jesus to talk about the coming future restoration kingdom of God on earth. That's the good news and it is very good news. To him be the glory, the kingdom, if you like, in the Lord's Prayer. What word in the Lord's Prayer is mentioned twice? The answer is kingdom. Jesus said, when you pray, please say, may your kingdom begin. May it come. May it be fully manifested on the earth as it will be at the second coming. Amen. He gets very excited and backs it up with a solid amen. Give my greetings. Very personal here. Shows that he loved these people individually. To Prisca and Aquila. And the household of Onesiphorus. He then tells us. Erastus remained in Corinth. Trophimus was left sick. I find that interesting. It meant that Paul did not have. The miraculous power to heal everybody. All the time. Some people were sick. And had to endure sickness until they were healed. Make every effort, Timothy, to come before winter. It's getting cold. I need that cloak I just reminded you about. Eubulus sends greetings, as do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters, otherwise known as the Israel of God, Galatians 6.16. There is a future for present-day Israel. And if you're watching the news, you can see that they're suffering horribly. God is allowing that kind of suffering and will allow a greater so-called great tribulation in the future where Israel will be attacked. Those are people who are still unbelieving. They killed their own Messiah. Awful. And they're going to be punished. They have not accepted Jesus as Messiah, many of them. The Great Tribulation will bring them to their senses. A remnant, at least, according to Romans 9 through 11, will be saved through that terrible uh, occurrence of the Great Tribulation, particularly the last three and a half years of it, just before the Second Coming. Finally, in 22, he says, May the Lord be with your spirit. Your spirit is your mind. Spirit and mind very, very closely. You are what you think. Your spirit is shown by what you say. The words that come out of your mouth reflect your spirit, your thinking, your personal life, the personal you. Finally, grace. I remind you of Acts chapter 20, verses 24 and 25, where Paul said, this is a marvelous verse, Acts 20, 24 and 25. Paul said, I went about preaching the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the grace of God exactly the same. The devil would like you to think that the gospel of the grace of God is different somehow from the gospel of the kingdom. Don't go there. Don't imagine anything as confusing and complicated as that. No, no. The gospel of the kingdom is a very gracious gospel because in it, God is intending to give the world to all the true believers and have them rule and reign with Christ on a renewed earth. There's a marvelous verse in Jeremiah 23, which I remember discovering many years ago, and it lives with me. The kingdom of God 
is in Jeremiah 23, a good verse to end these remarks with, perhaps. If I can find that very quickly, I want you to hear this. Is it verse 5? Yes, thank you. Behold, Jeremiah, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up yes. for David a righteous branch. Mm -hmm. He shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice, righteousness in the land. Yes. Marvelous. Isn't that wonderful? And at the, along with that, Jeremiah 27, 5. So there's two verses. Providentially, I think through the guidance of God, Carlos hit on exactly the right verse, 23, 5. Are you excited about this? The days are coming when the Messiah is going to rule and you're going to rule with him. And over in Jeremiah 27, verse 5, I, God is an I, not a what. Tell your friends, he's not three who's in one what. That's to turn God into a thing. Very bad. No, 27, 5, I, God, the one God of Israel, the one God of Jesus, have made the earth. I've made the men and the animals and beasts which are on the face of the earth. I made it by my great power, by my outstretched arm. My, of course, means one person. And I, which means one person, will give this wonderful earth, this creation, give it to the one who is pleasing in my sight. Is it worth being pleasing in God's sight? I would think so. You want to own the world and rule the world with Jesus, 1 Corinthians 6, 2. Don't you know the saints are going to manage the world? And if the world is going to come under your jurisdiction, wow, those are staggering verses. So Jeremiah 27, 5 is a suitable, a glorious note to end on, I think, today. Just a few comments here on verse yes. 18. Yes. Uh, Michelle says, bringing me into his heavenly kingdom. This mm. uh, is used by many to prove that they go to heaven upon death. Yes, that's horrible because they would be destroying Daniel 12, verse 2. So if you want for your notes, the best verse on that topic, Michelle is absolutely right there. Daniel 12, verse 2 says that multitudes of people who are currently in heaven, no, 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 sleeping, where are they doing it? In the dust of the ground. Is that heaven? Of course not. So that's part of the egregious, uh, along with the R mill idea, which is now trying to creep in and undermine the kingdom gospel. Along with that, as Michelle rightly says, people use that to prove, to prove it. No, they use it to confuse the entirety of scripture. The whole plan goes to pieces if you're talking about immortal souls going to heaven when they die they don't they go to the grave where they sleep and resurrection into the future kingdom of god on the earth is the only solution so preach those things with confidence yeah okay and um another comment when someone tells me they accepted jesus i might sometimes ask but do you accept Jesus' words, his teachings yes. of the kingdom of God? Yes. His teaching about the resurrection, his teaching about his God. Absolutely right. That's a wonderful Torrible remark. Thank question. you, whoever that is. That's absolutely excellent. They've been given, the public has largely been given a half gospel. A half gospel is not going to save you. You need the words of Jesus. Go through and mark in the New Testament the emphasis on word and words. For goodness sake, listen, Jesus said. Luke 8, 8, he shouted, he yelled, my words, my words, my words. If you don't get the words of Jesus, let me put it this way. If you've only got the works of Jesus, his miracles and his death and resurrection, which are wonderful and central and essential, if you don't have the words of Jesus, you've been taken in. So repent. And get that right. Go back to the word of the kingdom of God gospel. And the Bible will come alive for you in a new way. I promise you. Okay, good. Um, mm -hmm. One more comment here. Yes. So Jesus will be the ultimate king in the kingdom. But yes. David will be the king over Jerusalem and the 12 tribes yes. under the leadership of Jesus. Absolutely. I think that Israel, what we refer to as Jews today, roughly 
whoever they turn out to be exactly, the bloodline Jewish people will still have, when they're converted, that is, through the Great Tribulation, a remnant will still have a lead position. People will say, I want to get hold of, of a Jew because he knows God. They will still have a superior position under Jesus and the saints will rule with Jesus. And as you rightly say, the, the so-called widescreen gospel is most important. Moab and Edom and Assyria even will be converted as whole nations. But yes, I think that's right, that the apostles will have a very special position along with Jesus, yes. And one more, yeah. if I would get your comment here from Rick. Mm. Besides the deaths of many innocent Israeli, Israelis, Israelis mm. at the hands of Hamas, yes, many innocent Palestinians in Gaza have been mm -hmm. killed at the hands of the Israeli army. Yes. So both sides have innocent blood yes. on their hands, which Absolutely. I don't believe Jesus or God would sanction. That's absolutely right. It, it's far from being right. As, as the opening session, uh, our session today, you, I think you played us something from the man who says that no nation is Christian. That is 100% right. No nation is Christian. Is it clear? If the kingdom of God were here now, Jesus would be sitting on the throne of David in Israel, and he's not. The kingdom is coming. That's why you're supposed to pray, may your kingdom come. May your will, God, be done when the nations wouldn't dream of building a tank or having a gun. If they did, they'd be put away very quickly by a, a, a judge, Jesus, who would not prevent, would not for a, mad, for a moment imagine them having tanks to kill each other. No, it's out of the question. So that point is entirely right from Rick there. Appreciate it. Yes. Uh, sorry, one more question here. Yes, Anthony. yes, of course. If you don't mind. No, 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 of course. Thrilled. When Jesus was asked by a Jew yes. how many will be saved, Jesus indicated a few. Was he saying a few Jews or a few mankind in general? Uh, my answer would be a few in general, I think. And he also said in that same context in Luke 18, when the Son of Man comes back, will he find the faith? He's unsure. He's looking at the scene in his own time when so many people refused to believe and he wondered whether the faith would survive. I'm hoping it will. We're trying to do our little part to, to help that faith survive. I don't think he's talking about a few Jews. He means a few people because he knew the gospel was going to go equally, the gospel of the kingdom, to Jews and Gentiles alike. But looking at people, he said, in the parable of the sower, 75% of those who start well, they actually started well by receiving the gospel of the kingdom as the seed they got sown correctly as kings in training. But 75% of those people failed. Some people are quoting you now from Luke chapter 8, verse 13. Some people believe for a while. Well, that's not what you hear on television. The idea is that if you did the sinner's prayer, you're saved, it wouldn't matter what you do. That's just wrong. That's to water down the whole scheme. So I appreciate the comment there very much. All right. Thank you, Anthony. We will be back next Sunday, God willing, and the technology. And we will begin the letter of Titus, I believe we said. So we will just go on to that next letter from Paul. <clears throat> And uh, it's a short read, I believe. So from there, we will see what we might go back to the Old Testament or Old Covenant, as Anthony likes to call it. Maybe one Old Testament covenant book after Titus. Just to follow up on this, um, on the question about the war, the ongoing war there in Israel, the latest, I should say. Uh, gives me a chance to ask you to read our beliefs on the focus on the kingdom.org. There are our beliefs. Um, if you go down the points here, you will see that we have a section on this issue of the wars and uh, violence. As you see there, the third bullet point from the last 
Christians ought never to take up arms and kill their enemies and fellow believers in other nations. And the kingdom of God ministry says God and Jesus would not sanction any war or killing. Yes, uh, on the part of Christians, just to be clear about it, uh, Christians, we believe, are not to be part <clears throat> of the world in that way. And for more information on our stance, uh, go to the website here, ChristEnemyLove.com. Jesus practiced love of enemy to his own death. And the New Testament presents this teaching as an unqualified commandment to be obeyed by his followers. According to the Sermon on the Mount, this is in stark contrast to Jesus' own Jewish law, that is the law of Moses and tradition regarding holy war, lethal self-defense. And this site explores uh, the topics known as pacifism or non-resistance, mainly of the last century, which we believe have, mis have been misrepresented by many Christians through millennia. So we we do our best here to show a balanced approach to this and you can find many articles there uh there you go so those are the latest articles and i try to keep these sites updated okay let's see what do we have now <clears throat> announcements before we leave here uh we have let's see just want to highlight our ministry partners. You have Scattered Brethren Network with Pastor Robin Todd every Monday night, uh, EST. Actually, we just had a time change in the East Coast here of the US. So I think this will be at 7.30 PM. Anyway, uh, please subscribe to Scattered Brethren. Robin Todd goes on live every Monday night, usually, or Monday morning, wherever you are in the world. Just check the uh, schedule, the times, and uh, that's the Scattered Brethren. So that's tomorrow night. And uh, check out the other ministry partner, kogmissions.com. Um, Tracy just hosted a very interesting conversation on Halloween, on Halloween. <laughs> And uh, with Claire McNall, she's done a, a series of talks with uh, uh, Claire, who is a former occult, occult a witch, I think. Uh, I think so. <laughs> and uh, so, yes, she was a practitioner of the occult, so an ex occult practitioner, Claire. So, Check that out, very interesting. I put that in the chat. And also the KOG Missions Conference this month, actually it begins this uh, weekend, is that right? This coming weekend. And there you go, session one with Anthony begins. Uh, when does this begin? It begins Thursday, Thursday, November 9. Again, please check your local times. I know we have viewers from around the world, Australia, New Zealand, Asia, Europe. We appreciate you and your support. So the KLG Missions Conference latest one for this year begins this weekend. Anthony and myself will be some of the speakers there. So check that out. And one last one. I have a discussion on Wednesday, so that's a day before the conference, Wednesday, November 8, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, a discussion on the sons of God in Genesis 6 with our friend Greg Dybel from Australia, and we will talk about that very important story there, very important scripture in uh, Genesis 6, it has uh, a few views, as most things do, uh, a few views about it, but uh, we will present the views that we believe uh, should be um, should be seen through. So check that out. All right, so we will close with prayer now. Father, thank you for the time, for Anthony, for the many decades. 
We pray for these fallen world, the wars, the conflicts, the innocent bloodshed every day, it seems. We thank you for Paul, these incredible letters to this man, Timothy. We thank you for both of them and their zeal and faith and the sound doctrine that they have transmitted to us. Father, we pray for our health, as I said before, uh, our viewers out there, our little church here, the health of uh, Vicky, I'm thinking of, especially, uh, Jenny Wyeth in Australia, Greg Dybel, and others, uh, for continued good recovery from their uh, different surgeries and different ailments. And we pray for everyone else out there as i said so until we meet again we pray in the name of jesus as we always do amen god bless everyone see you next time